Welcome to our online audio library. My name is Mr. Bookman. If you enjoy audiobooks, make sure you press the like button, subscribe, and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our new uploads. I just looked up today's book on our audio card catalog, and it is now playing and ready on your device. So with that said, let's get right into the book. The Major's Lease by S. McCurgy a curious little story was told the other day in a certain civil court in British India. A certain military officer, let's call him Major Brown, rented a house in one of the big cantonment stations where he had been recently transferred with his regiment. This gentleman had just arrived from England with his wife. He was the son of a rich man at home, and so he could afford to have a large house. This was the first time he had come out to India, and was consequently rather unacquainted with the manners and customs of this country. Major Brown took this house on a long lease, and thought he had made a bargain. The house was large, and stood in the center of a very spacious compound. There was a garden which appeared to have been carefully laid out once. But as the house had no tenant for a long time, the garden looked more like a wilderness. There were two very well-kept lawn tennis courts, and these were a great attraction to the Major, who was very keen on tennis. The stablings and outhouses were commodious, and the Major, who was thinking of keeping a few polo ponies, found the whole thing very satisfactory. Over and above everything he found the landlord very obliging. He had heard on board the steamer, on his way out, that India landlords were the worst class of human beings one could come across on the face of this earth, and that is very true, but this particular landlord looked like an exception to the general rule. He consented to make at his own expense all the alterations that the Major wanted him to do, and these alterations were carried out to Major and Mrs. Brown's entire satisfaction. On his arrival in this station, Major Brown had put up at a hotel, and after some alternations had been made, he ordered the house to be furnished. This was done in three or four days, and then he moved in. Annexed is a rough sketch of the house in question. The house was a very large one, and there was a number of rooms, but we have nothing to do with all of them. The spots marked C and E represent the doors. Now what happened in court was this. After he had occupied the house for not over three weeks, the Major and his wife cleared out and took shelter again in the hotel from which they had come. The landlord demanded rent for the entire period, stipulated for in the lease, and the Major refused to pay. The matter went to court. The presiding judge, who was an Indian gentleman, was one of the cleverest men in the service, and he thought it was a very simple case. When the case was called on, the plaintiff's pleader said that he would begin by proving the lease. Major Brown, the defendant, who appeared in person, said that he would admit it. The judge, who was a very kind-hearted gentleman, asked the defendant why he had vacated the house. "'I could not stay,' said the Major. "'I had every intention of living in the house.' I got it furnished and spent two thousand rupees over it. I was laying out a garden. But what do you mean by saying that you could not stay? If your honor passed a night in that house, you would understand what I meant, said the major. You take the oath and make a statement, said the judge. Major Brown then made the following statement on oath in open court. When I came to the station, I saw the house and my wife liked it. We asked the landlord whether he would make a few alterations, and he consented. After the alterations had been carried out, I executed the lease and ordered the house to be furnished. A week after the execution of the lease, we moved in. The house is very large. Here followed a description of the building, but to make matters clear and short, I have copied out a rough pencil sketch which is still on the record of the case and marked the doors and rooms, as the Major had done, with letters. I do not dine at the mess. I have an early dinner at home with my wife and retire early. My wife and I sleep in the same bedroom, the room marked G on the plan, and we are generally in bed about eleven o'clock at night. 
the servants all go away to the outhouses which are at a distance of about forty yards from the main building only one jamadar porter remains in the front veranda this jamadar also keeps an eye on the whole main building besides i have got a good faithful watchdog which i brought out from home he stays outside with the jamadar for the first fifteen days we were quite comfortable then the trouble began one night before dinner my wife was reading a story a detective story of a particularly interesting nature there were only a few more pages left and so we thought she would finish them before we put out the reading lamp we were in the bedroom but it took her much longer than she had expected it would and so it was actually a half an hour after midnight when we put out our sixteen candle power reading lamp which stood on a teapoy near the head of the beds only a small bedroom lamp remained but though we put out the light we did not fall asleep we were discussing the cleverness of the detective and the folly of the thief who had left a clue behind and it was actually two o'clock when we pulled our rugs up to our necks and closed our eyes at that moment we heard footsteps of a number of persons walking along the corridor the corridor runs the whole length of the house as will appear from the rough sketch this corridor was well carpeted still we heard the tread of a number of feet we looked at the door c this door was closed but not bolted from inside slowly it was pushed open and horror of horrors three shadowy forms walked into the room one was distinctly the form of a white man in european night attire another the form of a white woman also in night attire and the third was the form of a black woman probably an indian nurse or ayah we remained dumb with horror as we could see clearly that these unwelcome visitors were not of this world we could not move the three figures passed right around the beds as if searching for something they looked into every nook and corner of the bedroom and then passed into the dressing room within half a minute they returned and passed out into the corridor in the same order in which they had come in namely the man first the white woman next and the black woman last of all we lay as if dead we could hear them in the corridor and in the bedroom adjoining with the door e and in the dressing-room attached to that bedroom they again returned and passed into the corridor and then we could hear them no more it must have taken me at least five minutes to collect my senses and to bring my limbs under control when i got up i found that my wife had fainted i hurried out of the room rushed along the corridor opened the front door and called the servants the servants were all approaching the house across the land which separated the servants quarters from the main building then i went into the dining room and procuring some brandy gave it to my wife it was with some difficulty that i could make her swallow it but it revived her and she looked at me with a bewildered smile on her face the servants had in the meantime arrived and were in the corridor their presence had the effect of giving us some courage. Leaving my wife in bed, I went out and related to the servants what I had seen. The Chowkidar, the night watchman, was an old resident of the compound. In fact, he had been in charge of the house when it was vacant, before I rented it. Gave me the history of the ghost, which my Jamadar interpreted to me. I have brought the Chowkidar, and shall produce him as my witness." This was the statement of the Major. Then there was the statement of Jokai Passi, Chakadar, defendant's witness. The statement of this witness, as recorded, was as follows. My age is sixty years. At the time of the Indian mutiny, I was a full-grown young man. This house was built at that time. I mean two or three years after the mutiny. I have always been in charge. After the mutiny, one judge came to live in the house. He was called Judge Parson, probably Pearson. The judge had to try a young Mohammedan charged with murder, and he sentenced the youth to death. The aged parents of the young man vowed vengeance against the good judge. On the night following the morning on which the execution took place, it appeared that certain undesirable characters were prowling about the compound. 
I was then the watchman in charge as I am now. I woke up the Indian nurse who slept with the judge's baby in a bedroom adjoining the one in which the judge himself slept. On waking up she found that the baby was not in its cot. She rushed out of the bedroom and informed the judge and his wife. Then a feverish search began for the baby, but it was never found. The police were communicated with and they arrived at about four in the morning. The police inquiry lasted for about half an hour, and then the officers went away promising to come again. At last the judge, his wife, and nurse all retired to their respective beds where they were found lying dead later in the morning. Another police inquiry took place, and it was found that the death was due to snake-bite. There were two small punctures on one leg of each victim. How a snake got in and killed each victim in turn, especially when two slept in one room and a third in another, finally got out, has remained a mystery. But the judge, his wife, and the nurse are still seen on every Friday night looking for the missing baby. One rainy season the servants' quarters were being re-roofed. I had then an occasion to sleep in the corridor, and thus I saw the ghosts. At that time I was afraid as the Major Sahib is today, but then I soon found out that the ghosts were quite harmless. This was the story as recorded in court. The judge was a very sensible man. I had the pleasure and honor of being introduced to him about twenty years after this incident, and with a number of people he decided to pass one Friday night in the haunted house. He did so. What he saw does not appear from the record, for he left no inspection notes and probably he never made any. He delivered judgment on Monday following. It is a very short judgment. After reciting the facts, the judgment proceeds. I have recorded the statements of the defendant and a witness produced by him. I have also made a local inspection. I find that the landlord, the plaintiff, knew that for certain reasons the house was practically uninhabitable, and he concealed that fact from his tenant. He, therefore, could not recover. The suit is dismissed with costs. The haunted house remained untenanted for a long time. The proprietor subsequently made a gift of it to a charitable institution. The founders of this institution, who were Hindus and firm believers in charms and exorcisms, had some religious ceremony performed on the premises. Afterwards the house was pulled down, and on its site now stands one of the grandest buildings in the station, that cost fully ten thousand pounds. Only this morning I received a visit from a gentleman who lives in the building, referred to above, but evidently he has not even heard of the ghosts of the judge, his wife, and his Indian ayah. It is now nearly fifty years, but the missing baby has not been heard of. If it is alive, it has grown into a fully developed man. But does he know the fate of his parents and his nurse? In this connection it will not be out of place to mention a fact that appeared in the papers some years ago. A certain European gentleman was posted to a district in the Madras Presidency as a government servant in the financial department. When this gentleman reached the station to which he had been posted, he put up at the club, as they usually do, and began to look out for a house, when he was informed that there was a haunted house in the neighborhood. Being rather skeptical, he decided to take this house, ghost or no ghost. He was given to understand by the members of the club that this house was a bit out of the way, and was infested at night with thieves and robbers, who came to divide their booty in that house, and to guard against its being occupied by a tenant it had been given a bad reputation. The proprietor, being a wealthy old native of the old school, did not care to investigate. So our friend, whom we shall, for the purpose of this story, call Mr. Hunter, took the house at a fair rent. The house was in charge of a chaudicar, caretaker, porter, or watchman, when it was vacant. Mr. Hunter engaged the same man as night watchman for this house. This chaudicar informed Mr. Hunter that the ghost appeared only one day in the year, namely the 21st of September, and added that if Mr. Hunter kept out of the house on that night, there would be no trouble. 
i always keep away on the night of the twenty first september said the watchman and what kind of ghost is it asked mr hunter it is a european lady dressed in white said the man what does she do asked mr hunter oh she comes out of the room and calls you and asks you to follow her said the man has anybody ever followed her nobody that i know of sir said the man the man who was here before me saw her and died from fear most wonderful but why do not people follow her in a body asked mr hunter it is very easy to say that sir but when you see her you will not like to follow her yourself i have been in this house for over twenty years lots of times european soldiers have passed the night of the twenty first september intending to follow her but when she actually comes nobody has ever ventured most wonderful i shall follow her this time said mr hunter as you please sir said the man and retired it was one of the duties of mr hunter to distribute the pensions of all retired government servants in this connection mr hunter used to come in contact with a number of very old men in the station who attended his office to receive their pensions from him by questioning them mr hunter got so far that the house had once been occupied by a european officer this officer had a young wife who fell in love with a certain captain leslie one night when the husband was out on tour and not expected to return within a week his wife was entertaining captain leslie the gentleman returned unexpectedly and found his wife in the arms of the captain he lost his self-control and attacked the couple with a meat chopper the first weapon that came handy captain leslie moved away and then cleared out leaving the unfortunate wife at the mercy of the infuriated husband he aimed a blow at her head which she warded off with her hand but so severe was the blow that the hand was cut off and the woman fell down on the ground quite unconscious the sight of blood made the husband mad subsequently the servants came up and called a doctor but by the time the doctor arrived the woman was dead the unfortunate husband who had become raving mad was sent to a lunatic asylum and thence taken away to england the body of the woman was in the local cemetery but what had become of the severed hand was not known the missing limb was never found all this was fifty years ago that is immediately after the indian mutiny this was what mr hunter gathered the twenty first september was not very far off mr hunter decided to meet the ghost the night in question arrived and mr hunter sat in his bedroom with his magazine the lamp was burning brightly the servants had all retired and mr hunter knew that if he called for help nobody would hear him and even if anybody did hear he too would not come he was however a very bold man and sat there awaiting developments at one in the morning he heard footsteps approaching the bedroom from the direction of the dining-room he could distinctly hear the rustle of the skirts gradually the door between the two rooms began to open wide the curtains began to move mr hunter sat with straining eyes and beating heart at last she came in the english woman in flowing white robes mr hunter sat panting unable to move she looked at him for about a minute and beckoned him to follow her it was then that mr hunter observed that she had only one hand he got up and followed her she went back to the dining-room and he followed her there there was no light in the dining-room but he could see her faintly in the dark she went right across the dining-room to the door on the other side which opened on the veranda mr hunter could not see what she was doing at the door but he knew she was opening it when the door was open she passed out and mr hunter followed then she walked across the veranda down the steps and stood upon the lawn mr hunter was on the lawn in a moment his fears now completely vanished she next proceeded along the lawn in the direction of a hedge mr hunter also reached the hedge and found that under the hedge were concealed two spades the gardener must have been working with them and left them there after the day's work 
the lady made a sign to him and he took up one of the spades then again she proceeded and he followed they had reached some distance in the garden when the lady with her foot indicated a spot and mr hunter inferred that she wanted him to dig there of course mr hunter knew that he was not going to discover a treasure trove but he was sure he was going to find something very interesting so he began digging with all his vigor only about eighteen inches below the surface the blade struck against some hard substance mr hunter looked up the apparition had vanished mr hunter dug on and discovered that the hard substance was a human hand with the fingers and everything intact of course the flesh had gone only the bones remained mr hunter picked up the bones and knew exactly what to do he returned to the house dressed himself up in his cycling costume and rode away with the bones and the spade to the cemetery he waked the night watchman got the gate opened found out the tomb of the murdered woman and close to it interred the bones that he had found in such a mysterious fashion reciting as much of the service as he could remember then he paid some bookshees reward to the night watchman and came home he put back the spade in its old place and retired a few days after he paid a visit to the cemetery in the daytime and found that grass had grown on the spot which he had dug up the bones had evidently not been disturbed the next year on the twenty first december mr hunter kept up the whole night but he had no visit from the ghostly lady the house is now in the occupation of another european gentleman who took it after mr hunter's transfer from the station and this new tenant had no visit from the ghost either let us hope that she now rests in peace the following extract from a bengal newspaper that appeared in september nineteen thirteen is very interesting and instructive the following extraordinary phenomenon took place at the hoogly police club building shinshura at about midnight on last saturday at this late hour of the night some peculiar sounds of agony on the roof of the house aroused the resident members of the club who at once proceeded to the roof with lamps and found to their entire surprise a lady clad in white jumping from the roof to the ground about a hundred feet in height followed by a man with a dagger in his hands but eventually no trace of it could be found on the ground this is not the first occasion that such beings are found to visit this house and it is heard from a reliable source that long ago a woman committed suicide by hanging and it is believed that her spirit loiters around the building as these incidents have made a deep impression upon the members they have decided to remove the club from the said buildings end of story twenty